on. There we go. We'll try that again. Good evening, everyone. Ooh, I even got an echo today. The open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. And now I hand it over to Jerry. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm calling this um, monthly meeting of the uh, Boston Disability Commission Advisory Board to order. And with that, um, we'll start with introductions to my left. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Juan Ramirez from the South End, uh, Commission member. Paul Karen, I work at the BPDA, Boston, Mass. Olivia Richard, um, and I am from Brighton. Ducia Lubovskaya, commission member, and I am from Boston, Mission Hill specifically. And on the phone? And on the phone, Elizabeth, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yes, Elizabeth Gingflower, uh, vice chair. I'm from Back Bay, and at a certain point, I am I'm trying, trying to still come in person, so at a certain point, I won't be on the phone. I'll be in transit. Right. Not a problem. And again, I'm Jerry Boyd, and I'm uh, from West Roxbury. And the next thing on the agenda is the approval of the May minutes. So, uh, Jerry, I do actually believe that based on uh, not having a quorum today currently at the meeting, okay. we will have to hold off on voting on the meetings till the meeting minutes till either the end of this meeting if there are more people in quorum, or we can hold it over and vote on the minutes uh, next month. Sure, sure, that that would be great. Thanks for that uh, reminder about Robert's rules there, Jessica. Um, and the next thing on the agenda is announcements. Does anyone have announcements from the commission? Go ahead, Olivia. Um, I have some announcements on behalf of Stephanie Zaya, who runs an organization called Pathway, providing access to happiness. Uh, basically, it provides recreational opportunities for folks with disabilities. Um, we work hard, we play hard. Uh, so they have some upcoming events. Um, sailing on July 14th from 1.30 to 4.30. Space is limited, so you register on their website, which is www.path-way.com. Uh, they also, on August 25th from 12.30 to 5.30, are having a harbor cruise to George's Island. Space is also limited on that. Um, and that's all I have so far. Great. I've heard of that organization. It's a, it seems like they do a lot of fun things. So thank you for that, Olivia. Any other announcements from the commission members? Go ahead, Paul. We spoke about earlier, I talked to John Crowley, Commissioner of the Arts Council here at City Hall, and we spoke about having an art show here at City Hall for people with disabilities. I know it's in the beginning stages, but looking forward to moving forward with that. Yeah, I'll certainly ta talk with the Commissioner and we'll see if we can get that, uh, get that planned. Thank you. Any other uh, announcements from the Commission? Anything, Elizabeth, that you wanted to bring up in terms of announcements? No, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have a hello from the Health and Human Services Chief, Marty Martinez. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, I am, I wanna make sure I can see everybody. Hi, I, um, I just wanted to come and say hello. 
For those of you who don't know, I'm the Chief of Health and Human Services and the Disabilities Commission uh, lives within the Health and Human Services Cabinet. Um, and the work that we do across the Cabinet is very consistent with the work that the Disabilities Commission does, which is to break down barriers so that all Bostonians can access opportunities. So the Commission is one of nine, is one of ten departments in the Health and Human Services Cabinet. And so I'm excited to just sort of be here to both make sure that the Commission itself and Commissioners know um, the work that we're doing around Health and Human Services uh, with the Commission, but also to do two things. One, thank you for lifting up uh, voices from within the community into the work we need to do here in City Hall. You know, oftentimes we go out into the community and we talk to residents and constituents and find out some of the issues that we need to be working on. And many times we're learning new things that we never knew were some of the issues that are of concern or things that we should be tackling. Um, and so for Health and Human Services, that's the work we're trying to do. Uh, Commissioner McCosh and her team that's here, some that have been here for many years, some that I think have been here for two days or three days. Um, but thank you so much to the work of the team. You continue to make sure that voices are heard and that we're tackling the issues that we need to be tackling around accessibility, around thinking about systems and policies, uh, architectural access, and a variety of pieces of work that are really important, uh, including making sure vo uh, folks have access into City Hall. The thing that uh, I want to just be here to say to you all and sort of share with you is that it's really important for me that we make sure the city's doing everything we can do, not only to be supportive and create opportunities, but maybe do things that we're not doing today that we could be taking on. Um, so as a city official, I say this often. I think I sat in this seat just yesterday saying this to a group of city councilors. I welcome feedback. I welcome opportunities to push us to think about what we're tackling and what we're taking on. Health and Human Services is doing a lot of work to cut across issues. So we have the um, Veterans Commission, we have the Age Strong Commission within our midst, the Health Commission uh, working on youth employment, a variety of issues that live within the Health and Human Services Cabinet. So I tell you that because if there are issues and concerns that people want to raise up and want to push us to do, uh, please do that. Lift that up, not only through the commission commissioner, but through your role as a commissioner yourself. Um, one of your commi fellow commissioners, Gardley Sanchez, works in my office, is outside of my office every day. So uh, he can lift up those issues as well. Um, but push us. Um, I think that's a really important thing that I can't stress enough, um, to push us to work harder and be better to represent all of our communities. I'll leave you with this last thing. One of my criticisms that I have when I was in this uh, outside of city government, I used to say this all the time. Um, I don't say it anymore because I'm not sure my, mayor, my, my boss, the mayor, would like me to say it, so I don't say it anymore. But I used to say that city government's too siloed. Too many things happen in separation and not enough things happen together. So I welcome your uh, guidance, your support, um, and your advocacy to make sure that we continue to break that down so that people are getting their needs met, not just in one area, but all across the area so Bostonians can thrive, not just get by, but really thrive in our community. So I just wanted to come here and, and say thank you for the work you're doing and know that you have a champion in my office and the commissioner and the Disabilities Commission staff would have it no other way. Um, so thank you so much for giving me a chance to say hello, Jerry. I appreciate it. Great. Not a problem. Thank you for being here. Next on the agenda is we have a presentation on Climate Ready Boston by Alicia Pagan. If you could make your way to the podium. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Pagan. I work with the Environment Department for the City of Boston with Climate Ready Boston. And Climate Ready Boston is our city's initiative to be more resilient to climate change impacts. I have a PowerPoint slide. I'd love to walk that through with you guys. And then we're also handing out the PowerPoint um, right now. So Climate Ready Boston is pretty new. We were really started in 2016, and we wanted to look at what were the climate change impacts for the city of Boston, what the future could potentially be like. Before I go into the data and the science of what our 
city does. I'd like to just give you an image of what the environment department is composed of. So we have various initiatives around waste, around carbon neutrality, so reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, Re um, conservation commission and protecting our urban spaces. We have the air source pollution control, which regulates how much air pollution we have in our environment, historical preservation, um, and Greenovate Boston. Greenovate Boston is kind of a key one. Um, it's for community engagement and outreach related to all environmental action. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, hence, there's a lot of teams in the department. Um, and Climate Ready Boston is really specifically for taking action to being more prepared to climate change. And I wanna share the risk with you all because I think we could do a better job at informing folks of what are the risks for Boston. So we looked at what we could, what would happen with extreme temperatures, so heat, extreme precipitation, sea level rise, and coastal storms. We find that with extreme temperatures, we're having more hot days. We're also finding that there's gonna be more stormwater flooding and more coastal and riverine flooding. So that has a lot of impacts on people's health. It has impacts on people, how people move around, how they're able to be protected in their homes, um, how they can get their resources that they need to get to. And so f a little bit more about heat. Here is a map of the downtown area or Boston area of where we expect some hot spots. So as you can see on the map, there are some areas that are more red, and that correlates to areas that don't have a lot of shading from tree, tree canopy, um, and either there could be a lot of asphalt, um, a lot of gray cocoa infrastructure that causes the area to be more hot. And due to climate change, we expect that Boston will be as hot as Birmingham, Alabama by 2070. Um, and so that has a lot of implications on how people are going to just live a livable life in Boston. Um, I think that we aren't prepared enough in our infrastructure, um, and I don't think there's enough cultural awareness on how to be more prepared for heat waves. We also looked at stormwater flooding. So this is a map of what we expect flooding could look like in 2030, 2050s, and 2070s. So the orange is 2030. So there you can see there's pockets in Dorchester, in the South End, Rosendale, West Roxbury, Alston, Brighton. And these are areas that are at a lower elevation. So because the land is at a lower level, water pools on that area and can start flooding streets or sidewalks and even possibly buildings if it floods really badly. And then the other thing we looked at is coastal flooding. So this is a map of um, historical Boston and present Boston. So if you look on the left, that is a map of Boston, I think in the 19, or no, 1600s. Um, and as you can see from the image on the right, we filled in a lot of our land. So most of East Boston, lots of Charlestown, downtown, and South Boston is filled land, meaning that they're at a lower elevation. So when there is flooding, um, the water just flows through the neighborhood because there aren't natural land formations that are at a higher elevation. And because of that, we notice that the water ends up going back to where the original tide lands were. This is an image of what we expect the 2070 uh, flooding to possibly look like. We expect around three feet of sea level rise, and that can flood parts of East Boston, Charlestown, downtown, this uh, South Boston, Dorchester. and. The reason why we think this is a citywide issue is because there's so many transportation routes going through these neighborhoods. So if people need to go to the downtown area to work, to play, um, their route could be impeded by coastal flooding. We saw that during the 2018 storms when the two huge events shut down the aquarium station. Um, 
and people weren't able to transport back and forth from East Boston and um, downtown Boston. So um, I'm giving you this information just so that you know what the data is. I'm tr not trying to frighten you all because we are doing a lot around this. Um, we also want to note that we aren't just looking at how the infrastructure is being impacted. We're also trying to know how people are going to be impacted. And we know that people aren't impacted equally. So we're able to map different concentrations of more socially vulnerable people, people with medical illnesses. There's a few other layers. Um, we also map out um, higher concentrations in Boston where there's elders, children, people who speak low to no English, um, low to no income, people of color, disabilities, and medical illnesses. And with that, we're able to have an like look at trends. So if we're saying we want to address heat and we can look at a hot spot, we can also say who lives in this hot spot? Are they elders? Are they children? Do they have disabilities? And what sort of solutions can we create that really addresses their needs rather than just saying a blanket, one size, one solution fits all? So um, I kind of would like to hear your thoughts maybe after I present, but it'd be really useful for us to know how this impacts the disability community directly, um, and more personally, how it impacts you, because I think with personal stories, that allows us to really understand um, how we're going to address these problems. So what we're doing about it, we're doing a lot. Um, the Climate Ready Boston full report lays out all the different strategies we want to utilize. We have around 11 different strategies and a total of 39 different initiatives. They're combined with things like creating district scale solutions, which I'll talk about a little bit later, creating temporary flood barriers, expanding our tree canopy, doing a lot more engagement and education, changing our zoning to allow for resilient zoning, changing um, our first floors to be elevated, elevating our mechanical systems, having more green infrastructure, um, having more solar panels and district microgrids so that people are protected and because we have a layered system of approach, um, we know that there's a multi-tiered solution to this problem. Are there any questions? <laughs> I realize I threw a lot at you. Any questions from the uh, advisory board at this point? Go ahead, yeah. Duzia. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a few more slides, FYI, but oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm looking at your, uh, these, Okay, for lack of a better word, I look at the paper that you presented here, and I, I was attending yesterday, I think yesterday, before yesterday, I was attending a training, also similar related to what to do when someone is, um, what to do when a, this, when quote unquote disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. And I am thinking, what exactly are you working on? What are you trying to, do I mean I, I didn't quite understand what are you are you trying to do more solar are you mm -hmm. think, asking if if solar panels are necessary or what is your goal with this company just for starters cool yeah um, so that's a perfect segue um, into my next section but just to overall there is kind of three three city initiatives around this. So there's Climate Ready Boston, which is hoping to change the built environment um, in the short term and long term. So we're looking at what we can do now and also in 2050. And then there's also the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Racial Equity. And they're thinking about resilience in that way of how do we overcome systemic oppression on the day-to-day -day basis. And then we also have um, emergency management that think about kind of what is our plan from now in five years from now for that, if a storm were to hit tomorrow, how are we prepared? So there's a lot of different initiatives going on and we're working to coordinate together to make sure that we're um, prepared. 
Um, so for more long-term planning, there's something called the Resilient Harbor Vision. And the mayor announced this last October, and the hope is that in order to address coastal flooding, we could create barriers along our waterfront. And these barriers could look like elevated roads, they could look like elevated parks or harbor walks that basically prevent the water from overcoming, over flooding the roads. And our hope is that we can use more nature-based solutions, so more spaces for recreation and play that are connected and protective um, and that enhance our relationship to the waterfront rather than cutting it off. And so what we've been doing, the Resilient Harbor Vision is actually a summation of various neighborhood plans. So we have a coastal resiliency plan for East Boston, for Charlestown, for downtown South Boston and Dorchester. Um, we've completed three out of the five and we're hoping to finish the rest by spring of next year. So what we do is we break down each neighborhood. So we look at, for example, this is a map of East Boston and we see if there's any specific flood pathways into the neighborhood because as you can see here, there's one going along the greenway and that floods into hundreds of homes. And so if we're able to build a solution right at the beginning of that flood pathway, then that can protect all the homes within the neighborhood. So our hope is to build solutions as close to the shore as possible. And as I mentioned, these solutions could look like um, raising a harbor walk, maybe having a seawall, maybe changing your buildings so that they're more um, watertight and they don't let water to go in. Or you can have a softer shore where it's kind of like a marsh um, where you elevate and like a park and then it slowly turns into a marsh into the ocean. Um, and you can also have like gates along canals and channels so that the water doesn't um, overtop. So there's a handful of solutions and we have this toolkit. So our hope is could we combine these in different ways along the shoreline in Boston. Um, so in a way we're proposing a really big vision that can completely change our relationship to the shoreline. And these are examples of what they look like in other cities. So the top is one of a river walk in Chicago, and this is a stepped edge. So it's elevated, and because it's elevated, it doesn't allow for the water to, over, to go over the, the walkway. And then um, there is the Hudson River Park, and that is using a park space, a green space, to block water and to also retain it. Um, there's also the Toronto Waterfront Park, and then a park in Oslo. So f when we finish up these neighborhood plans, we really propose a vision of what it could look like. So this is an image of the Greenway. So I mentioned the Greenway is a flood pathway into East Boston. This is an image of what if we elevated the Greenway so it's like sloped up um, and made it a better park at the same time. What is pretty useful about these plans is that we lay out when we need, what we need to do. Um, we really try to segment the waterfront into different sections, different projects, how much they're gonna cost, and when we need to build them by. So this timeline is really useful, um, and we have these timelines for all the different neighborhoods. Another thing that is ongoing right now is that the BPDA is working on a flood overlay district. So as I mentioned, we have um, these district scale solutions that are thinking of elevating our outdoor, outdoor spaces. We're thinking, could we also um, encourage buildings to elevate their buildings so that they're protected because people need to be protected in their buildings too. And these, um, these guidelines include things like elevating your mechanical systems, possibly elevating your first floor, um, having an emergency plan for your building, and a few other ones. Um, and then I also handed out a flyer. We have an event on July 16th. This is a pretty important open house. At this open house, we're gonna start presenting what these options could look like in the downtown waterfront. So we wanna show kind of like how could the built environment be changed so that it's resilient and also livable. And it'd be great to have you all be there to give your input um, and feedback. And then lastly, I guess I wanted to also ask 
just generally, we have our Green of Eight team um, that does education outreach, and we've been thinking a lot about how we can work better with the Disability Commission and also um, with other folks to enhance our work. So it'd be great to hear what you guys think. Yeah. Um, Alicia, mm -hmm. any uh, additional questions from the Commission? Oh wait, excuse, excuse me, miss. Um, we're gonna take questions from the commission first. Any questions? Go ahead, Juan. Yeah, I really don't know how to uh, phrase this question or perhaps I uh, would like to get more comments about. Sure. Um, uh, this is Juan Ramirez, by the way. Um, so I think you were talking about like there are like different objectives, uh, let's say in case of emergencies right yeah. now. Um, in case of emergencies, uh, people who are body abled, they can perhaps make decisions to yeah. take care of themselves. Yeah. Uh, people with disabilities perhaps don't have that option sometimes because elevated areas are hard to reach yeah. uh, or perhaps in the, yes, because of the, situa of the situation, it, there is chaos and uh, people are going on their own. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if your area, your department um, has some, uh, work toward that part mm -hmm. about how perhaps they can reach the community mm -hmm. for providing some kind of solutions or strategy, strategies mm -hmm. to perhaps assess those kind of um, uh, issues. Yeah, so I think that if you're thinking about what how we're prepared today, that would be a great question for emergency management because they're thinking through those problems right now. Um, and then if you're thinking more long term of like what would the city look like five to 30 years from now, 50 years from now, that's a question for us and the BPDA. Um, and so far, as I mentioned, I don't think we're doing enough job at reaching um, different communities to get their input on how we can make these solutions more accessible. Um, as I mentioned, there are things like elevating the roads and that can be very annoying for a lot of people. Um, and so it's kind of a question back at you of kind of like, what do you think that we could do better. Um, and we have this open house, but completely open to doing stronger engagement. Yeah. Hey, Olivia has a question. Yeah, um, this is Olivia. Um, you know, ramps can often be paths for flooding, and mm -hmm. but ramps are a necessary part of my life. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if ramps go away. So how do you find that happy medium between the access features that we need mm -hmm. and the potential impact on flooding and... Yeah, yeah, so um, we, for all of the solutions that we're proposing that is on roadways or sidewalks, all need to be ADA accessible. That is baseline. Um, we're incorporating those design guidelines. Um, and I think we have to design it appropriately so that there is, um, it's possibly like a series of really long ramps um, to get down. Um, and then also along those lines, because we understand it's so, it could be really troublesome with these new changes, we are proposing solutions that are as close to the waterfront as possible. Um, so for example, like Christopher Columbus Park in the north end, that could actually become a flood barrier. And if we were to elevate that park, that means we wouldn't have to make the changes on the roads. Cool. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to prioritize solutions that are better for people in general, yeah. Um, but as I mentioned, the open house is a great opportunity for you to see kind of what that cross section could look like of a road and be like, this is not gonna work um, yeah. and I'd like something better because the design team will be there and they can take that feedback and actually incorporate it into the solutions. Sure, yeah. great. Uh, any other questions from the commission members? Elizabeth, are you still on the phone? She's not? Yes. Um, oh, she is, I'm it sorry. It's difficult for me to hear the presentation. I think it's an important topic. So I will uh, review the materials after, but um, uh, thanks for um, the offer to ask a question. 
Okay, great. Um, I just had a question. It's Jerry. Um, and for the event on the 16th, uh, is that uh, obviously that's wheelchair accessible and there's easy access to, to the event? Yes. Yeah, there is. Um, it's on a second floor, but there is an elevator. Okay. Uh, we can just access it right away. We won't have to call ahead or anything if we wanted to participate in the event. If there is interpretation um, needs, I think that'd be great to get that notified in advance. So if you know of anybody that's planning on t attending that needs um, interpretation and translation, we can arrange that. Okay, great. Yeah. And I know we had at least one question from, from the public. Do you want to make your way to the podium and a ask your question? I think Amanda, right, was curious where the event was being held. So the event is, as I mentioned, July 16th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the BSA space. I think it's 290 Congress Street. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have a presentation on beta blocks by Tracy Beard. Hi, good, um, good evening, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name is, of course, as you mentioned, Tracy Beard, and I am a summer fellow with the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. And um, I'm here to talk to you about a project that uh, we are working on called Beta Blocks. You're probably wondering what is Beta Blocks. Um, and Beta Blocks is a, it's a pilot project um, in collaboration with uh, Emerson College Engagement Lab and an architecture and urban um, design firm called Supernormal. Um, and uh, what we are doing is looking for um, feedback, community feedback on technology projects that impact roads uh, streets, I mean, roads and streets are the same thing, but sidewalks um, and kind of public um, interfacing uh, with that, um, with those technologies and communities. So kind of like, what does that actually mean? It might mean having a speed bump that um, um, kind of measures pedestrian traffic. It may look like um, uh, the SUFA, digital signs that you might see and making those more accessible. Um, it might also mean um, air quality sensors to test um, pollution in the air. So those are the types of technologies that we're looking to kind of test in neighborhoods. And so that's one part of the beta box project, but the essential part of it is Develop being a process in which community members have uh, can provide feedback to the city about the types of technologies that are implemented in communities and kind of finding out from communities what they would like to see in their communities, what's needed, how can we design those technologies in communities that are more success, uh, more accessible, so it's not like, oh, we've designed it, we've built it, now we realize it doesn't work. <laughs> um, that sometimes happens. Um, and so we really would like to ask, um, um, and the pilot areas that we're looking into for this short pilot is in Codman Square, Chinatown, and Lower Alston. Um, and we're, we're really asking for uh, community members to come and join us um, to kind of have these discussions about technology, what you would like to see, um, what are the concerns that you might have around technology, privacy issues, data collection issues, um, and other, other concerns that you might have around technology and, and community. So the first meeting in Codman Square is going to be Monday, uh, July 1st, um, and that will be held uh, in the Codman Square Health Center. Um, the second, uh, uh, which would be in Chinatown for a Chinatown community, July. Um, so the Codman Square is July 1st. Chinatown is July 2nd. Um, and that will be held at 66 Hudson um, 
uh, Street, and then Laura Alston uh, will be uh, held at uh, 22 Western Ave, and I think that is the Harvard Ed Portal. Um, and the Laura Alston uh, meeting is July 9th, um, and so we're we're looking to uh, have people join uh, for those events and it's the first of a series of events so this is just the kickoff kind of events for um, longer conversations so the pilot is kind of testing these engagement pieces out testing out technologies that might be implemented and the hopes of developing a longer range strategic plan for the city so if you have any questions i'll be more than happy to answer Great. Any questions from the commission? Go ahead, Ducia. Yes, um, thank you for your presentation. It's Ducia. I have two questions. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, you said it's Codman Square. I remember I remember Codman Square. I was there a few months ago. I'm, there was a, um, a health center. I can't remember. Maybe it's not the same place where, that I was passing. Is it? Um, wheelchair accessible? I do believe so, um, it, that it is wheelchair accessible. I think, let me take a look and see. Um, yes, I, I, you know, at least I, from the outside facing, I've only been to the, the building once, and so I do know that there is like a wheelchair ramp accessible to the, to the health center. Yeah, so it's, um, it's also attached to um, Codman Academy. Um, so it's a part of that kind of complex. Oh, I apologize then because I saw somebody that had stairs, so probably the wrong place. No, no, no. I mean, and what I can do is verify that for you just to make sure. And if, if it's not, then we can, we can have further discussions with the team to make sure that everyone has access. So. Um, that's that's me not necessarily making sure. That's me needing to make sure that that that's that everyone can have access to the to the space. And the second question, and be my last one, is what are the hours? Oh, so the hours for uh, each event they are 5:30 to 7:30, and I can um, we can send out um, information. Great. Any other questions from the commission members? Any questions from members of the community? Oh, can you make your way to the podium and, and state your name, please? My name is Amanda Smart, and I'm just wondering, is the one in Austin on July 9th? Yes, it's on July 9th. Okay, at the Harvard Ed Portal? At the Harvard Ed Portal. And there's also an Evite uh, uh, RSVP link. Um, if anyone has any difficulty accessing that link, um, you can give me um, an email, um, or a phone call um, to register, and um, and I'll make sure that you get registered for the event. Um, and my email address is tracy t r a c y dot beard b e a r d at boston dot gov. And is there a phone number, Tracy? Mm -hmm. uh, the phone number is uh, area code six one five nine zero five nineteen twenty two. Great. Amanda, did you have another question? I didn't. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the commissioner's report, and my report will be uh, very brief. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that I had the I had the uh, privilege of going to the opening of Martin's Park on uh, June 14th, I believe that was. It was a great uh, community event, very, uh, very inspiring. Lots of, lots of people came out um, and the park itself is, is beautiful and it is very inclusive uh, 
you know, to folks with, with disabilities, um, you know, very accessible walkways, ramps. I did actually happen to the, the main centerpiece and, and I would say the most accessible play structure at the park that I saw was the pirate ship. I was able to actually, you know, wheel right onto the pirate ship and explore it, look through spy, you know, spy glasses and, and whatnot. And, and so it was really, really uh, neat. So I definitely want, um, want to commend the folks, you know, from the city and hopefully the commissioner and staff can, can, um, can report back on on how you know great I think I think the the park is, and I would encourage anyone, family, friends who has the opportunity to to go to to try to explore it. The one thing that I would say that we still need to keep working on is to actually the actual play structures. I didn't see myself, and not being you know an architect. Um, or anything, I didn't see a lot of play structures other than the pirate ship that folks with disabilities could actually interact with very easily, like accessible swings, uh, slides, and whatnot. I may have missed things like that, but I, I just didn't see that. So, so, but I did enjoy the event, and and it looked like like everybody was having a great time. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to mention was that there is a an R tag meeting tomorrow night. That's um, the Riders Transportation Access Group. That's at the Transportation Building at 10 Park Plaza at 5.30, 5.30 to 7.30. And that will be just a ride-focused uh, meeting. So there'll be staff, the, the actual head of the ride will be there, along with um, a representative from the Uber and Lyft pilot, which we've discussed, you know, here, uh, you know, during our meetings, and there'll be they're directly presenting on uh, presenting and also fielding questions from from the public. So I would encourage anyone who has the opportunity to to attend to please uh, to please do so. So, uh, but that is my report at this point. And the next uh, thing on the agenda is the commissioner's report, which will be uh, handled by Jessica tonight. Thank you, Jerry. Um, yes, Commissioner uh, Makosh sends her regards, um, but unfortunately, um, she's unable to make it tonight. Um, it is at least fortunate for her that the reason that she's unable to attend is because she currently, she's been asked to sit on the advisory board for Massport to look at the Uber and Lyft drop-off spaces at Logan Airport to ensure that people with disabilities are able to gain access to those new drop-off spaces. Um, and so tonight was the kickoff event. And as um, the figurehead for our office and the commissioner, she wanted to make sure that she was in attendance personally. Um, so. I am giving the report on her behalf, but she sends her regards and will be here next month with a full report as to how that meeting went. Um, I do also get the joy though of introducing two new staff members. Um, I'm gonna put them on the spot a little bit, although I did ask them in advance for their permission and uh, ask them to come up to the podium to introduce themselves and say just a couple things about themselves um, and how long they've been at the office. Hi, good evening. My name is Melinda Andrade. I'm the new outreach engagement specialist, and today's my third day. Um, so I guess welcome for myself to the team. Very excited to join the Mayor's Commissioner for Person with Disability. Please reach out if you have any questions, concern. Pretty sure I'll be able to help you guys. Thank you. Hi. Olivia has a question. Uh, just for the minutes, how do you spell your name? Melinda, M-I-L-I-N-D-A, Andrade, A-N-D-R-A-D-E. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Karina Caban. I'm the new program manager for the parking, accessible parking program. Um, something about me. Well, it's my actually my third week here. Mess it up. My third week here, and I'm just really excited to be here. 
And you guys will slowly get to know I'm an elephant lover. <laughs> Just had to mention that. What did but. you say, an elephant lover? Yes. Oh, very nice. I <laughs> love elephants, so yeah. You guys will hear that a lot. Just FYI. <laughs> Great. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to have the two of them. Uh, as they said, um, it's Melinda's third day and Karina's third week. Um, so slowly but surely, they're getting uh, getting accustomed to our office. Feel free to reach out to them. Um, I'm excited for them to get to know each and every one of you and the issues that are important to you. Um, so feel free um, to reach out to me and I can give you their contact information um, or also their contact information follows the same order that all of our city email addresses do. So feel free to reach out to them directly as well. Um, additionally, we have two events coming up. Uh, one hopefully is on everybody's radar because it's in two days. Um, and that's the community forum on disability issues. So that's Friday, June 28th from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Suffolk Law School, 120 Tremont Street. It's on the first floor. We've held it there a couple times. Um, so it's once you go uh, through right enter the building, uh, it'll be right dead ahead of you. Um, we're doing it a little differently this year, um, only slightly. Um, we're trying to really work on elevating the work of the whole Health and Human Services Cabinet. So as Chief Martinez noted, there are 10 departments within the Health and Human Services Cabinet. So what we're going to do is for the first hour, each department is going to speak for five minutes about what they do. So we're forcing them to be quite brief and quite concise um, so that we can get all the departments in with the goal of the second hour being uh, for the community to ask questions of um, any department. So it could be our department if, they're, if it's a disability specific question, but it could also be of the Boston Center for Youth and Family or the Office of Recovery Services or um, the Age Strong Commission. So the disability community will get an opportunity to not only see what our office is working on, but also what the city and the Health and Human Services Cabinet as a whole is working on for people with disabilities and with people with disabilities. The second event is our annual ADA Day celebration. That'll be Tuesday, July 23rd from 12 to 2 on the plaza. Um, that will be keeping true to form uh, with free t-shirts, which we're working on the logo now. We're excited about it. Um, free music, food, um, and lots of different organization tables like we do in the past. So uh, knock on wood, it'll be good weather, but not too hot. Um, and we'll hope to see all of you there, uh, both at the forum on Friday and then at the ADA day uh, in July. Olivia, do you need a clarification on? What do you, what's up? Um, the date. Yes. It's just it, it, I, what's the date for the ADA celebration again? Absolutely. No problem. Uh, so the ADA day celebration is Tuesday, July 23rd. 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 Not 21st. Not 21st. 23rd. I appreciate um, you making sure that I enunciate and clarify. The 23rd, 2-3. It's a Tuesday. Um, let's see. What else commissioner sent me with notes? So last week, um, commissioner testified in front in favor of a bill that supports employment for people with disabilities. And also the city is working on engaging people with disabilities for the national census uh, in 2020. So there's a big push within the city of Boston. We've got a census liaison within intergovernmental relations. And there's a specific committee related to um, those who are older adults and people with disabilities. And Colleen Flanagan has been appointed to the steering committee for that as a representative of the disability community. And so within her role, she'll be reaching out to other um, members within the community to kind of uh, get the word out about the national census that's happening in 2020. So this is not the city census that will also be coming out, I believe, in about six months, but the federal census that is happening a bit later. So we'll be giving you more information in regards to that um, moving forward as we get closer to it and uh, we, different ways that the disability community can help out or the disability community can let us know the kind of the concerns and barriers to census, um, providing census information. I think that's all I have, Jerry.
Thank you, Jessica. Uh, and just a clarification for myself, because um, just fairly recently I went onto the city website and was able to to complete the city census. Uh, is that and but you're saying it's gonna the it's there's something else that's gonna come out. I mean, in terms of the city census. So I believe. Uh, so I think. I may be wrong about the city census information, okay. but the federal census, what we're working on is clarifying that the federal census sure. is different than the city census. Sure. Um, and that both are equally important, okay. um, but also um, are regulated by different things and determine different things. So um, this is to work to highlight uh, the importance of filling out both and giving both inf information to both entities. So, but as far as you know, if somebody goes on to the city website or whatnot, they can still access the city census currently. Yep. So if you are on the city of Boston website filling out a census, that is the city census. Right. Uh, the federal census is not yet out um, and it won't be accessed by the city of Boston website. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. And next on the agenda is the architectural access update with Patricia Mendez. Thank you, Jerry. Am I on? Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. My name is Patricia Mendez. <clears throat> I'm the architectural access specialist for the commission. Um, my update this month starts with the architectural access board um, executive director search. Uh, the committee had interviews last month, and they continue to have interviews on next week, um, hoping to uh, make a final decision shortly. And we, I just want to give a shout out to William Joyce and Karen Brand, the current staff, because they are doing a, a fantastic job, amazing job with all the workload and handling the move. So the office moved to 1000 Washington Street. And I just also want to mention that the meetings continue to be in the usual place at one Ashburton place. Um, next, we continue to review project developments that are going through uh, review for BPA and for PAC. Uh, some of them I'd like to mention is the Olmsted Green uh, Affordable Housing. It's a project that had uh, three phases and two of them are constructed already and the, the last third phase is going to be construct, constructed this year. So as usual, we had uh, conversations about accessibility and sidewalks and pedestrian safety in crossings, especially on Harvard. Uh, Harvard Avenue. This is Dorchester. Um, the next uh, two m developments I had a lot of conversations about accessible materials is uh, Kenmore Square. There's two developments coming up in, in the Kenmore Square area. Um, so we discussed the accessible path being smooth and having concrete. Um, and the other one is uh, Winthrop Square Park, which is in Winthrop Square, and that is the park outside the development of the, the large Winthrop Center. And that is all under design. The next I want to mention is Boston University Data Sciences. That's in Commonwealth Ave. It's uh, a new science building. It's about nine, uh, nine floors. I think, and that also had um, its new construction, and that is right next to the current Sargent centers. So we had great conversations about accessibility and uh, interaction with the, um, the back street that had some level changes and Commonwealth Avenue that, that has um, um, drop off, pick up activity. Uh, the next uh, meeting that I went to was a, a, about transportation, about uh, pedestrian safety. That was in Eggleston Square and Columbus Avenue. 
it, there's a large intersection in that area and the pedestrian crossings are pretty huge. So the conversation was about having a pilot um, in the short term to reduce the pedestrian crossing distance. Uh, so that it will be a short term project and it will collect data and reaction of the neighborhood and that would inform um, the design of a future more permanent project in the Eggleston Square intersection. Then uh, we reviewed a few parklets for uh, Jamaica Plain and Newberry Street. Now parklets are little interventions on right next to the sidewalks to add uh, some seating area with some shade and um, cool places to, to be outside in the good weather. Um, so as I said, two of them are in Newbury Street. They're under construction now, and the one in Jamaica Plain would be in Green Street, and that's in design. And that is it for me. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from any members of the commission? Um, Go ahead, Ducia. Uh, just, thank you, it's Ducia. Just a quick question regarding Kenmore, Kenmore Station. Um, is that this construction habit that happening near Fenway Park? Um, there is a bunch of new developments around Kenmore Square. The one in Fenway. Oh. Fenway Park, that might be coming in the future, but that wasn't the one I was referring to. Oh, okay. The one I was referring to is in the, that wedge between Beacon Street and Comath. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from any members of the commission, either in person or on the phone? Any questions from any members of the public? Hearing or seeing none. Uh, thank you, Patricia. You're welcome, Jerry. Next uh, item on the agenda is old business. I don't think we had any old, old business. Um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Um, but we did have an old action item. Uh, which was writing a letter in, in, in opposition to the assisted suicide bills that are in the House and in the Senate, Massachusetts House and Senate currently. Um, and Jessica had emailed the draft of, of that letter out to everybody. And I know that Elizabeth had some, some edits, so I was thinking that we could discuss that here uh, if possible. I don't know if because Elizabeth is on the phone, whether that's practical. Elizabeth, are you still on the phone? Um, yes, actually, it's taken me all this time. I'm literally just arriving, even though the meeting's about to end. No, no, no. But, um, yeah, um, so I... So you, you, you're here, Elizabeth? Can you hear me? You're here, Elizabeth? Um, yeah, I'm just Yeah, we could wait. I mean, we could, I could uh, certainly, I, um, we so could. I'm going to come up even if it's mostly closely. Yeah, no, 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 but please. I, I was going to say, we can. I've been we, on the phone, but I've, uh, I've been also trying to arrive. No problem, Elizabeth. Just tell her we can table okay. that discussion we're gonna, until. We're going to, we're going to table the discussion just until you get up here. That's no problem. Great. Sure, okay, thanks. Is there any new business that anyone would like to discuss? Hearing none, is there any uh, questions or comments from the public that any about anything that that folks would like to discuss? I think we have a question from David. If you could make your way to the podium, please, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> David Vieira from Hyde Park. A few weeks ago, um, Councillor Zakem had a hearing regarding the proliferation of walks and runs and, and other 
fundraising events that have been happening in the city that have contributed to road closures. Um, I had intended to go to that meeting, but I had a conflict. So on Father's Day, I get off the orange line and I am trying to make my way across Copley Square amid a tangle of um, electrical wires that are strewn across the sidewalks and barriers all over the place because Boylston Street had been closed down for some kind of um, track event. Boylston Street at Dartmouth Street was completely blocked off with four or five running lanes, which when I got there, no one was running in. And I asked the fellow who was at the intersection how was I supposed to get across the street to go to the CVS because I had an errand to run? And he told me my options were to go all the way down to Clarendon Street and cross there and then walk all the way back, or go all the way down to Exeter Street and cross there and walk all the way back. And then, of course, if I had done that, I would have had to retrace my steps to one block or the other. My point here is this. <clears throat> there was no way for me to get across the Dartmouth Street intersection because of these lanes that were set up for these sprinters. And when I asked the fellow, uh, after I asked the fellow uh, what my options were, he said, oh, well, why don't you, you, you know, you can always jump the barriers as I'm standing there with my red and white stick and I told him very specifically that I didn't think that was funny. But there has to be an option where people, not just people with disabilities, can walk through these closures without having to go out of their way one block or the other, especially if you're in a manual wheelchair or on crutches or on a walker. Um, there's, I agree with Councillor Zakem that there's been way too many road closures in the downtown area that has disrupted both pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Um, a lot of these things like this sprinting race, whatever it was, um, could have taken place in one of our outer neighborhoods. There's plenty of roadways and parkways in West Roxbury and Hyde Park and the outlying districts in the south where I'm sure a lot of these things could be set up without the disruption being caused by these closures. And there's, there was no provision made at the Dartmouth Street intersection for anybody to get across that street. Um, <clears throat> I also want to point out that I called the Office of Tourism Special Events and Sports last Wednesday. I got a recording. I wanted to discuss this with them. I got a recording that said, leave your information and we will call you back. And as of this morning, a week later, I had not received a call back. So I called them again at 9.30 this morning and I received the same <clears throat> spiel on their answering machine, and I'm still waiting for a callback. And I explained to them that this was an ADA question that I needed to ask them, and I'm very disturbed that a department of this city, when told that there's an ADA issue, fails to call back the person who was making the inquiry. That's all I have to say. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Well, I'm so sorry that, that that's occurred. Um, it's not a matter of being sorry, sir. It's a matter of looking at what needs to be done to um, eliminate the issue for everybody. I understand. Um, I'm still uh, sorry that you had to go through that. Um, but thank you for bringing the issue up. I think it's a very important issue. Has anyone from the 
the commissioner's office. Uh, I'm sure that the commissioner's office is informed any time that there's a special event or, or a run happening as the commissioner's office. Can you talk to us a little bit about like what happens or, or what you can do in, in terms of those, when those things ha come up? Pat Patricia's making her way to the podium, David. Oh. Oh, hello. Um, hi, David. I'll, I'll be happy to follow up um, okay. and contact them on your behalf about, okay. about your experience Very good. and the events. Thank, Thank you, you. You're welcome. Thank you for bringing it up. But do, do our, uh, does the commissioner's office in any sort of pre-planning, do they get notified that events are coming up and do they, do they work with, with uh, uh, different offices about setting up you know, viewing areas or accessible ways of path when streets are blocked off currently or no? Um, for the large events, we, we do. For the parades that we've had, we, we have um, coordination communications, um, but we can always do uh, a better job with the feedback that we're receiving from our constituents. Sure. Thanks for following up, Patricia. Um, I will. I will also say I just want to piggyback on Patricia. What Patricia said. So we do, as Patricia said, work on the big major um, parades that the city hosts. So the sports, most often the sports viewing parades uh, when we win championships, um, which you know has happened a couple times this year. Um, and we work with sports and tourism um, pr fairly frequently. I believe that probably. Uh, I agree with you, David, that uh, waiting a week with no answer is pretty unacceptable, so we will follow up with them absolutely. I would imagine, uh, just for some context, um, that you probably got an answering service because they are currently, their office is under reconstruction, so I'm not sure uh, where they are located and uh, where all their office members are. Regardless, they should be getting back to you, so we will follow up. It doesn't matter where they are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we, our office will follow up with them um, and we'll work to ensure that when races and things like that happen, um, what the accessible pathways are, um, because we do have to also, we have to consider the safety of everyone um, and safe travel passage of everyone. And we will also work on getting out more information regarding road closures. Um, so that um, people with disabilities and just the general public when there are road closures, our office can work on elevating that information because I know that the transportation department does have those on their website, um, but that's something that we can also highlight and elevate for people when they are planning uh, their weekends and uh, weekday travel. I know Olivia has a question or a comment. Yeah, I want to, uh, Dave, I got caught in that same hullabaloo um, with Adidas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a track meet or something um, and I was trying to get to the MBTA station and I basically had to break a barrier which is the joy of the power chair. Um, they were not happy with me but I got to my station. Right. Go ahead, Elizabeth has a comment. I live in the Back Bay area and I've experienced uh, um, similar problems of uh, where there's the information is difficult to come by. The police department was not able to be helpful. They did direct me to 311 and I found depending on who I spoke to, at least at the major level of road closures, they were able to provide some of that information, although I did find that who you speak to even at 311 one person might convey the information a little bit differently than um, another. But I, I do, so I, I think this is an important issue because I, I have found that, um, or I, I've also then gone looking at websites, but I think that would be, that is important to, um, given the number of these events, it seems like it's almost every weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and also, that as I said, the level of difficulty I've found just finding basic information for people who are trying to arrive prior to when the, the roads close, um, that it, it's just difficult to um, get a consistent answer. 
Thank you, and thanks for uh, bringing it to our attention again, David. And and I'm glad that the uh, that the office, the commissioner's office, can can follow up. Um, and I'm sure, um, Councillor Zakem, even though the hearing's already passed, I'm sure that they would be happy to hear, you know, any of our comments or or, or concerns. So. So uh, can we contact them or can, can we maybe send letters through you guys, Jessica, you know, any members of the commission and you'll forward them to, to uh, Councillor Zakem? Absolutely, so we can get the information for where letters would be sent uh, regarding this issue and then uh, we can send that information out and you guys as, um, if you want as a commission to write a letter, then that would have to be voted on. But if you as individuals, as uh, members of the disability community, um, as well as the public um, are interested in getting those letters out, you could certainly do that as well. And I'll get you the information as to who it goes to. Great, thanks so much. Uh, but now I think we'll circle back to, um, we'll circle back to the old action item that we had, which was, uh, Again, a letter in opposition to the current House and Senate bills supporting assisted physician-assisted suicide. I know Elizabeth, um, you know, had some particular uh, edits or comments that she wanted to to address regarding the draft letter that Jessica sent. Um, and so I thought maybe we could just take the time now uh, to dis to discuss those so that we could you know, get the letter off as quickly as possible. Uh, thanks, Jerry. I, and I agree um, it is important to get this letter off as soon as possible, given this week is when um, the, uh, the House will still be holding their, um, uh, uh, their hearing. Uh, I was not able to attend May's meeting when I know that the, the topic and the discussion of the letter came up, however, as the chair of the Cambridge Commission um, back in 2012, when this was on the ballot, um, it, this generated a lot of um, uh, discussion and different viewpoints in, in that, uh, that commission. And our decision was to write a letter in support of, uh, uh, of that effort, although it was, uh, it was, it was, there were some people on the, the commission who had some varying opinions, but in the end we did have consensus to write the letter. My thought with this letter, and I, I'm uh, uh, very willing to um, make a, a few of the edits, is that I think it's important that it's always very helpful to have a draft like this that um, uh, has the important components in it. But I did think it, um, at the outset after um, introducing um, the commission and the, and the bill names to provide some brief summary or context about why it's of particular concern. Because on the one hand, I know that for those who um, aren't informed of some of the issues from the disability committee, um, a counter argument uh, to play devil's advocate could be, you're always talking about wanting autonomy and independence and your own decision making. Um, and that's something you too could decide. But I think the, um, to condense multiple variants of the argument, I think the concern the people in the disability community have expressed and experienced is that, um, that other people, that sometimes the physician is using their judgment or, or given the abuses um, that could occur in a situation that has, uh, as the letter points out, irrevocable, uh, 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 the irrev irrevocable outcome of death, that I thought that it would be uh, just by way of strengthening the letter um, to at least move move that lower paragraph up higher about if passed um, that and that that entire paragraph I think if it's placed higher helps position uh, the the um, commission's uh, concerns but also that that is what I'm 
was uh, advising for a letter such as this, that I think if there are, because in a, in a sentence that says something like, the view that someone is, quote, better off dead than disabled is too often held and acted upon, um, that we do know that there have been um, abuses or misdiagnoses by physicians under other jurisdictions where there, there exist. But I wondered if even statements like that might be a little bit too vague, that we're specifically talking about um, physicians uh, and who frankly, as a separate issue, but a related issue, are not adequately trained in medical school, in their residency training, and other than those who might choose to work with um, a certain population or if they have specialized in geriatric medicine, a portion of their patients will have, um, uh, perhaps uh, they will have experienced disability, but that I, I find at all levels of medical training, there is not an adequate understanding of disability. So it was, it was those kind of dimensions, just in a few sentences, that I wondered if, even if we don't, for the purposes of this letter, take on medical education, but on the other hand, the, um, I don't know that a term substituted judgment is, but that someone else is making that presumption. And I certainly anecdotally know of colleagues with disabilities who, for instance, um, in the hospital, are asked multiple times about do not resuscitate DNR in a way that made them think other people were making value judgments. You're already in a wheelchair, now you've got, you know, complicated pneumonia. Do you really want to, you know, us to take these measures? Whereas I think, as with any patient, present the options, present the choices, but those, those were ways I thought that might improve it as long as I, I would um, plan to um, get that back to you and Jessica in the next day. Um, does anybody have any additional thoughts? Go ahead, Ducia. Yes, uh, thank you. Elizabeth, thank you very much for pointing that out. I do concur with you regarding the medical field. I'm in the medical field myself for uh, more years, for 10 plus years, and I have to confirm that the medical community, whether it's doctors, nurses, and whatnot, they're not adequately educated about disabilities, and especially regarding that particular part about DNRs. I agree, it's, it's like, it seems situational or circumstantial, like either you can do this, or yes, this person did sign a DNR, but what if this happened, and then, so what they do usually in hospitals, I think, or nursing homes, I think if someone's able to speak for themselves, what they do is uh, they ask that patient or resident, does the DNR also relate to what your current condition is? And they have to say yes or no. So I do, I just want to say I do concur with that fact. Olivia? Yeah, I can attest to that. I was given a, uh, basically the most form when I was 25 in a nursing home. I was not even close to dying and they wanted to make me a DNR. Um, there are some evil things that happen and quite frankly, it's up to us to stand up against it. So yeah, anything that we can do to prevent people from being harmed uh, is Not a good thing. Is the conference will continue when the leader exits the call. To deactivate conference well, the phone just gave its opinion of my uh, <laughs> statement. Technology's taking over. <laughs> could I, could I to? Go ahead, Elizabeth, um, please. But for instance, I wondered if, um, with just some tweaking, but I think things like um, that someone is better off dead than disabled, even if there are some people who are thinking a version of that, I think perhaps using that language might be inflammatory in a way that's, rather than something that has, um, I think that the, the mention of mixed diagnoses and abuse, I mean, certainly 
the you know issues of someone having depression or th um, and then also I was interested to know with no safeguards um, I, I think it is very concerning and uh, and I don't know if language like inadequate safeguards is too um, that uh, it's supposed to be that um, these certain steps have have been gone through I have heard um, John Kelly and others express concern about sometimes the issue of the two physicians, that it might be that neither one of them is is knowledgeable. But is that what that with the no safeguards? Could you just? Uh, I'm not sure what the what the, what that meant, Jessica. I don't know who helped draft this 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 letter, but I'm not sure what what the what the meaning of that that was. So I will say that this is, um, to be quite honest, the letter that the board has written and supported for previous years. So this is, uh, in its in its um, almost entirety, um, what the board has approved previous years when this bill has come up. Um, that that being said, um, the commissioner then edited this version this round. Um, as the office was um, tasked with writing this letter. That being said, um, any edits that the board would like to do, um, they are more than welcome to. Um, we would just then have to um, send it out to the, to the entire board um, for their approval. Well, let me, um, I'll, I'll make sure I get back to you tomorrow on that um, because I know there's an importance of timeliness and frankly, I don't know among the letters they're reading, I, I don't know that they give particular weight to this letter um, from us, but I think if, I think there's ways it could be um, uh, strengthened that, that I've, I've described. And I also didn't know if it would be for this particular one, not as a change in um, precedent or how things are handled, whether, um, how the board feels about um, having my name added or all the executive board names added um, so that at least uh, the fact that I do have a background in medicine myself would would be present or would the preference be that if I were going to do that, it should be a separate letter? Uh, I, I would say as as chair, I mean, our names are listed. Uh, okay. You know the commission members are listed on the letterhead, uh, and as chair, you know it should be my signature. Um, I, I don't think that's that's necessary to add the executive board, um, uh, you know, separately to the letter. I mean, I suppose if we wanted to change the letterhead and say, say, you know, who the members of the executive board were next to the names, we could possibly do that. I don't know if the commission has any rules or any objections to that, but. We could certainly clarify that. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what Jerry said, the board is listed on the document and also in regards to the weight of the letter, um, intergovernmental relations um, is notified within our office that uh, that we are, that the board is sending a letter. And so um, the state reps and the state senator are aware that the city of Boston, um, that the disability organization within the city of Boston government uh, is sending a letter so that I believe that that does hold um, additional weight as an entity. Um, and our intergovernmental relations occasionally actually delivers the letter as well. Uh, that, that's helpful to know. And I certainly wasn't trying to downplay the commission's importance. I just don't know in these, you know, um, how, but that, that, that's very helpful to know that given it's difficult to know with any of these, um, with correspondence, you know, to what extent it's tabulated versus read, but, but that's um, very helpful to know. And I know we went, I th the one clarification I'd make is that usually for, for general purposes, I think the one issue, I think things like, um, titles that, that that can be awkward or even credentials. It's certainly not saying if someone has credentials and someone has doesn't that the lived experience and you know professional or personal expertise is any less or valuable or different. Um, so anyway, that was that was just what 
what um, I was mentioning. Okay, thanks. So moving forward, just, just to clarify, is that um, Elizabeth will kind of take the lead on, on, on making some edits and working with um, uh, the commission commissioner's office to, 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 to firm those up. And then Jessica, you'll send those out. Uh, you'll send that out for, uh, for, you know, final approval. Um, will we then have to wait till next month to, to vote on it or what, what would be the next step? I, hope not. I will clarify with the commissioner. I believe as long as we do not change, um, like the, the meat of the letter and the heart of it. I do not believe that we need to re-vote on it because we voted uh, in regards to that letter. And so um, I'll double check with her. I don't believe that we have to vote on it, but I would at least like confirmation from all of the board members that they have read it. Sure. Um, and in regards to um, just kind of a, to Elizabeth's point about credentials, not specifically related to this letter, but in regards to the letterhead, if any of the board members do have credentials or letters after their name that they would like to be added to the letterhead, um, please let me know, and we're happy to modify that uh, accordingly. Great. Uh, any other uh, any other discussion or, around uh, the letter? Hearing none. There's only just one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, before we adjourn, um, I know around the the original discussion around voting for the for the uh, approval uh, or the or in support of writing a letter, uh, I neglected to I neglected to initially uh, recognize or take take a vote, um, and, and I neglected to. Uh, initially recognized that there there was some opposition to to our writing a letter and for that I wanted to you know publicly apologize and to say that that I know end of life issues and whatnot are, are, are you know is a very important topic and as Elizabeth mentioned both sides you know both sides definitely um, should be heard and you know I I hope to do do better when these issues come up in the future. And I know that, that Jessica usually spots, uh, like she did earlier today, if I, if I wasn't following Robert's rules appropriately and she wasn't here last month. So, so maybe that's one reason why I, I didn't necessarily look. Happy look, to take the blame, Jerry. Look, look for that, but, uh, but you know, hopefully going forward again, I want us all to, to feel comfortable to bring up opposing views or whatnot. And uh, and I just wanted to say again, I you know hope to do better in the future. So, with that said, uh, I move to adjourn. Is there a motion? Is there a motion to adjourn? Any seconds? Great. All in favor? Aye. Great. See you next month.